It gets too hot out there, just tell them to turn the air conditioner up, okay? I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles this morning, to Matthew, the 16th chapter. And then flip over to Ephesians, the 5th chapter, if you will. I'm going to begin reading out of the 5th chapter of Ephesians. And then we're going to go to Matthew for the text that I'm going to be preaching from this morning. And the title of my message today is, Who Needs the Church? Again, the title of my message is, Who Needs the Church? I always try to find something to preach about to begin the new year. Of course, it doesn't begin until next Sunday. Uh, I probably won't be done today with the message, so I'll just continue it next Sunday if I'm not finished with it. If I am finished with it, we'll let you go home about 3 o'clock this afternoon. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff when you start talking about the church, okay? When you found your place, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm reading from the New King James Version today. And uh, in the 25th verse of chapter 5 of Ephesians, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Then I want you to flip over to Matthew, if you will. And we'll be looking in the 16th chapter. And I just want to read, I, won't, I, won't, I was going to start with verse 13, but uh, I precursed it with uh, Ephesians, what, what the church means to Christ. But in uh, verse 18, And I also say to you, speaking to Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. Father, we pray that you would just bless the reading of your word this morning. We ask God that we could glean from it. We ask God that we could be encouraged from it. Not only that, we pray, God, that it would challenge us to realize the importance of being a Christian who goes to church. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated, if you will. Now, here in Ephesians... He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Whether you realize it or not, the Lord loves this church. As every church that's founded upon his word, as every church that is part of his body that's on this earth today. Now, when we think of the church, many different pictures come into our mind. We think about steeples, we think about stained glass windows, we think about all the different things that are associated with church, but the bottom line is church is the people that are in the church who are the carriers or the indwell of the indwelling spirit of God that came into the individual when they were born of the spirit of God, when they were saved, convicted, when they received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, we see over in, uh, in uh, Ephesians, it's speaking of, of, of Christ's great love for the church, and he's comparing that with what a husband's love for his wife ought to be. And he was willing to die for the church. He gave his life. He shed his blood that we could be here today, that we could be called a church of the living God. We are the only thing, the only gathering where God gathers with us. All the other uh, groups in the world, all the other so-called religions are not alive. They are not a living, breathing organism as we are. We have life. We have life through the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of craziness that you hear today 
Well, I can, uh, I can be all right. Uh, you know, I, I can commune with God. I don't have to be in a building with a bunch of hypocrites. I can be out on the lake fishing for bass and communing with God. I can be out on the golf course hitting the little white ball around. And uh, except for the occasional cursing when I miss a two-foot putt, I, I just want to say that I'm communing with God. You don't have to be in church to commune with God. Anyway, the church is boring. I hate going to church. The preacher's boring. The music's boring. The people are boring. Perhaps you are boring because you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. But you get all these silly ideas about church. Let me tell you something. Christ died for the church. He shed his blood that we would have the privilege of coming into this place where we can lift him up, glorify his name, look forward to his return, knowing that Jesus died, that we might have life, and the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There is no other way to the true and living God but through his Son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood that we might be able to come and to meet like we're doing today. And I don't want to hear that you don't need church to be a Christian. I get tired of coddling people. I'm getting too old to coddle people. If you don't like church, you don't like God. It's that simple. People that are members here that never come, never darken the door. And I realize, and, and you know, somebody always brings this to your attention. Well, preacher, uh, you, you know that uh, I, I'm often providentially hindered because of my job. I understand that. I understand there are times that you can't come to church. And I understand there are times that you kind of need a break. I understand that sometimes sickness comes, sometimes death comes, sometimes we have other things that's going on. But the bottom line is, if you love the Lord, you're going to love church. So who needs the church as we begin this new year of 2020? And we'll start it next week. And someone will say, well, why can't I just be alone out in the country and, and, and just get close to God and Feel his spirit and all of these different things because the Bible commands us not to forsake the assembling together as some do, as many do in our society today. You know, one of the saddest things is the millennials today, the young people, they say they don't, they don't want anything to do with church. So what does church do? Church is trying to come up with all the worldly concepts and ways that they can in order to attract young millennials into the church because millennials say it's boring. The fact of the matter is, there is a process, there is a thing a church is supposed to be, and it's not an entertainment center. If you want entertainment, we've got entertainment everywhere. You can go anywhere, just about any time, and be entertained in this world that we live in today. Church is a place that we learn of God, grow in God, worship God, praise God, lift God up, and glorify His name, and love one another as believers. That's what church is about. It's not about coming in here to entertain one another. <clears throat> now, having said that, uh, consider the importance of church. Uh, church is something that is a local assembly of baptized believers. You know, you hear about the universal church. Well, what about the universal church? Yeah, every believer in the world is part of the universal church through the local congregation that they are a part of. Let me say that. So in other words, we are part of the local church. There, you know, one thing that we see so much of, especially here in the good old Bible Belt, one thing we see so much of is churchless Christians. Churchless Christians, people that don't need to go to church to be Christians. Well, I, I really don't need church to serve the Lord. Uh, but anyway, the Bible tells us that if we are believers, we are to love his body, which is the church. We're compared to the body of Christ. Now, there are three types of people that desperately need church. First off, uh, imperfect people. And secondly, people that need church are broken people. And thirdly, lost people need church. Those are the three types of people that need church. Now, when I say imperfect people need the local church, what am I talking about? I'm looking at you. Amen. 
and you're looking at me, the only people that are imperfect are the people that realize they're imperfect. And if you don't realize that you're imperfect, then you have a problem. That's all I can tell you. I don't know anybody that doesn't have issues. The local church is made up entirely of imperfect people. If you think you're perfect, you need to get your act together and you need to really examine yourself like we did at com communion this morning. But that, that, you know, the local church is made up of imperfect people and it is God's people who he loves without condition. In other words, God loves us. There's no condition involved. It's through grace and grace alone. And we're supposed to love one another that way. In other words, it's not conditional on what you do, whether I love you or not. Some people, if you don't do things the way they think you ought to do, then they're not going to love you. They're going to be critical of you. They're not going to want you to be a part of their church. If you don't smell the way they think you ought to smell, if you don't act the way they think you ought to act, they think you ought to just get on down the way and leave our church alone. I know I'm right, brother. That's honey sucker would say, I know I'm right, you hypocrite. You low down, dirty hypocrite. If it was up to some people, they'd get the church down to, to, to me and my three. To me and the three people that I think are most like me. I don't want any of this riffraff coming in here. Well, let me tell you something. You need to come to the place where you realize that you're imperfect. Because you're not perfect at all. As a matter of fact, there's nothing more imperfect in the church than self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the thing that causes more problems in church. And what is self-righteousness? Uh, self-righteousness are, are people who think that their way is the only way. They feel that they're perfect and everyone else is imperfect unless you do it my way. So, we both know who we are looking at this morning if you truly are a Christian. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Look at me. I'm looking at you. You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. If you're expecting to have a perfect pastor, you better start looking because there's not one in this world. I'll tell you that right now. If the local church was made up of people who never sinned, who never made mistakes, who never made wrong choices, people who never blew it, then we would certainly feel out of place if you're a human being and if you're a Christian. It's that simple. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need grace, would we? If we were perfect, we wouldn't need to bestow grace upon others. And I've said this a million times, and I'm going to say it again. Those that refuse to extend grace to others who are in need and who need grace, you've never received grace yourself from a holy God because the only reason you're sitting here, part of the body of Christ, is because of the fact that God bestowed his mercy upon you, a dying, dead, lost sinner on the way to an eternal hell, and he bestowed his grace upon you through nothing you did or nothing you could do. Amen. Now that's who you are and that's who I am. Amen. I know I'm a sinner. Yes. I, I know what God saved me from, but I want to tell you something. He didn't save me to perfection. He saved an imperfected human being. He brought me into the kingdom of God and it's through the grace of God every day that I can survive. Amen. Oh, I know you wanted a good, kind, encouraging message for the new year. Well, I'm giving it to you. This will help you if you listen to it, all right? Love without condition. So I'm thankful that I feel right at home here at Springdale Baptist Church with all you imperfect people. We're not perfect, nor does God expect us to be perfect. You know, I get carnal sometimes. Now, I know you don't. If you say you don't, you're a lying dog. You need to get on your knees and repent. You ought to run up to this altar and say, God, forgive me, because I'm a sinner. I sin. I may not do what the preacher does. Get upset out on the road. Never will forget. Somebody said to him, who was it? One of the kids or grandkids or something. Somebody pulled in front of me or something. I get drunk, drunk away in front of all that. Road rage! I'll not do that. 
Ron, I know you don't do stuff like that. Brian, I know you don't either. As much traveling as you do. You idiot! Get out of the way! I'm in the flesh for crying out loud. But God still loves me. But somebody said to me, he said, don't wave your hand around when you do that. They'll think you're throwing a sign at them. <laughs> and you're a preacher of the gospel. Well, I've really lost it if I ever throw a sign at them, okay? God help us. I get carnal sometimes. I'm fessing up. And if you, if you, if you were right with the Lord, you'd fess up. I get carnal at ball games. There's nothing that can make you more carnal than a blind referee. There's nothing that can make you more carnal when somebody is holding on to your grandson, about to mutilate him, about to beat him to death out there on the floor, and the ref's not calling a foul. Get him off my grandson, you blind idiot! I'm in the flesh. I will not do that. I have to repent all the time for stuff like that. Amen. We ought not do it. If you're a preacher, you ought to be perfect. <laughs> you show me a perfect preacher. I tell you, the perfect preachers are the ones that usually get caught in great sins down the road somewhere. Because they've got everybody so fooled. But I get in the flesh sometimes. I admit it. We're not perfect, nor does God expect us to be. The greatest problem in the church are people that think they are perfect and want to tell everyone else that they're imperfect. What kind of, what kind of folks do that anyway? I know churches are full of people like that. Thank goodness. I, don't, I know we don't have any of that here, or at least I hope not. Sometimes we forget the truth. So... Some folks are looking for the perfect church. Did you know that? Don't come here. You're not going to find a perfect church here. You know, one of the craziest things in the, in the age that we live in, here's, what, here's usually what they put. It's not usually, what do you all teach here at this church? What do you believe here at this church? It's usually, what does your church have to offer us? Well, we've got a gymnasium out back that we spent $4 million on. We have upward basketball, upward soccer, and now your old Springdale over there's got upward poker. Because they're definitely not a perfect church. I've said before, we can't afford a gymnasium, but we got round tables, 14 of them, over, over there in the fellowship hall. 14 round tables. Hallelujah, we'll get a church full of people if we have upward poker here. And we'll let, we let Delmar Patterson do the dealing. we get some of them little green glasses and put on him in that little green hat, and he looks like a dealer. But anyway, he can... He, <laughs> <laughs> he, he could get out there, yeah, come in there, that chair, hit me again, you know, all that stuff. Man, we'd make more money here than we knew what to do with, but we don't need that stuff. That's not what church is about. Upward basketball. And you know what I love about upward basketball? And y'all get mad at me. I know you do anyway. Get mad at me if you want to. What kind of sport is it where there's no competition? What are you teaching your kids? Let me tell you, life is competition. You're going to continually battle through life. It's going to be competition from the time you're born to the time you go to the grave. And who plays a game that doesn't have a score? That's one thing I admire about my brother-in-law. He said, there ain't no way I'm going to let my kids play a game unless they have to win it. I mean, my son-in-law. Did I say brother-in-law? My son-in-law. My wife said, I mean, my, my daughter's husband. <laughs> oh, Lord help us. <laughs> but anyway, what do you have to offer? What do you got for the kids? You know, that shouldn't be the question. The, the question shouldn't be, what do you have to offer? The question should be, uh, not, not what the church has to offer you, but what do you have to offer the church? That, that, that should be the question. I don't know how we get so carried away. 
but we do. Too often folks who forget their own imperfections grow critical. I know there's no critical people in the Baptist church. I know they just, everything just runs smoothly all the time. They never criticize anything. Like the old guy I heard about where the preacher asked him, he had a Freudian slip. Brother so-and-so, would you get up and give us a word of criticism? I mean, uh, uh, testimony this morning. Critical. I heard about a barber that was critical. Everything was negative. Negative, negative. You ever known anybody like that? I, I call him Negative Ned or Negative Nanny. I hope nobody's named Ned here. If so, I'm not talking about you. But anyway, I heard about this bar where he was negative. And this guy goes in one day, he's real excited. He's, getting, he's going to take a trip. He said, hey, man. He said, you'll never believe it. I'm going to take a trip to Italy. And the barber said, you are? He said, yep. What are you going over there for? Going over there to see the Pope. You are? How are you going to get there? I'm going to fly. The barber said, you know I wouldn't get on one of them planes. Ain't hey, nothing but a little old thin sheet of uh, metal, and uh, half the pilots don't know what they're doing, and planes crash all the time. There ain't no way that I'd get on that plane and go. And anyway, when you get over there, you're going to be in this big crowd. There's going to be thousands of people there on the courtyard looking up at the Pope. He's going to be about that big, and you're not going to get to see him hardly at all, and you're going to waste all that money to go over there and do that. The guy said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So a few weeks later, he comes back, and he comes into the barber shop, and the barber says, well, I guess you had a terrible time in Rome, didn't you? He said, no, it was wonderful. He said, I had a great flight over there. He said, for whatever reason, there was a guy that was feeling sick on the plane and didn't take his, uh, his, uh, his, his seat that he had paid additional for, in the privileged area, so they asked me if I wanted to sit there because there was no one filling that scene. I said, heck yeah. And he said, the flight was great. I could stretch out. I could sleep 10 hours of glory. He said, you get the roll. And he said, you're right about one thing. He said, there were thousands of people there, thousands of them. And I was sitting out there, and the Pope, I could hardly see him. But I just kind of felt that he kept looking at me. I don't know how he picked me out of that crowd. But he said, when the Pope was almost finished with his talk, that's what I do, give a little talk every now and then. But anyway, when he was done with his talk, all of a sudden, this guy in a robe and stuff comes up and says, Sir, could you come with me? The Pope wants an audience with you. He said, What? He said, so I went with him, and they opened this door, and they, lo and behold, there's the Pope standing there in all of his pompous glory. And I said, my goodness, I didn't expect to have an audience with the Pope. What did I do to deserve this? And the Pope said, well, I was looking, and I happened to spot your haircut. That's the awfulest haircut I've ever seen. And I wanted to find out who in the world gave that to you, so I'd never use him. Now, that's what criticism can do. <clears throat> Too often, folks forget their own imperfections and are critical of others. Uh, critical of everything that goes on. Crit critical of the church. What do we want to do as a church? Let me ask you that. Uh, what, what's our desire as a church? Well, we want to grow. But you can't grow if you're constantly being critical of one another and what other people do. Well, just let them do anything they want to. Yeah, they want to. Don't you think that we ought to leave the Holy Spirit to convict people if they're doing something wrong? Hmm? Is it really any of your business? No, it's not. That's between them and God. And not everybody's going to do things the way we do. Not everybody likes pizza. I like pizza. Not everybody likes certain colors. But yet... So what? It's none of my business. If Lori likes pink and I like orange, then so what? We're always trying to look out and be God's protector. We don't need to be God's protector. 
God's quite adequate of protecting himself and taking care of himself. I can tell you that right now. But imperfect people need to be a teachable people. A teachable people. That's one thing that I stress here at this church. Teaching is the most important thing that we do. Not entertaining. Uh, not, not doing things that, uh, uh, that are, appear to be uh, super religious. But teaching. Teaching the truth. The most important thing we do here at any church. Not just this church. In other words, loving the word. You know, one thing I got burned out with a long time ago. I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to shed some light on some things. I hadn't been to conferences in a while. Most of the lightweight conferences you go to, lightweight, you know, oh, while I'm on it, let's just, let's just get everybody aggravated, okay? <laughs> I'm getting too old to hold back. I just read an article this week that one of Lightweight's leading authors and Bible teachers is anti-Trump. <coughs> Beth Moore. I've read her stuff. I've gone over her stuff. And let me tell you something right now. Her early stuff was good, but the older she gets, the more she drifts away into what I call Christian mysticism. So, so we're always careful. What, what's wrong with these people? I heard she's buddied up with Joel Osteen. You know why? That's where the money's at. Why am I not a mega church pastor? I blew that a long time ago when I decided to preach the word and the word only. It'd be kind of nice to be a mega church pastor, fly first class everywhere, or have my own jet, Ron. Can you imagine having your own jet flying all around the country? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Having, having little men in suits follow you around talking into their sleeves? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? And Lord, when, when I die as a mega church pastor, I'm standing at the pearly gates and old St. Peter said, oh, he's here, he's here, oh, he's here. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then old Moses is going to come up there and he's going to say, hey, sign my Bible. Would you sign my Bible? That's how stupid some people are in this world that we live in. You're not a preacher to be some sort of star of some kind. I don't care if you have a church running to 250,000 people. If you're not preaching the word, you're going to go to an eternal hell. You're going to burn for eternity because you mishandled the precious word of God that was given to you to be handled correctly. Conferences. Oh, I went to one conference, Ron. You've been to them, too. I finally just quit going to them. Well, pastors, if you want your churches to grow, you need to think outside of the box. Thinking outside of the box, what in the world is that supposed to mean? Well, you, you need to think outside of the box. Uh, color outside of the lines. I was taught back in elementary school, stay in the lines. But now in order to grow my church, think out of the box, outside of the lines. Isn't that great? Uh, <laughs> think outside the box. Think outside. Color outside the lines. Boy, that's good advice. Back when I was a young pastor, I used to listen to that garbage. And most of it is, by the way. It's garbage. Because nothing's going to get done in the church. Listen to me. Nothing's going to get done in the church apart from the power of the Holy Ghost of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and standing firm upon the truth of God's Word and preaching it the way it's supposed to be preached and challenging people with the Word of God and all this secret-sensitive nonsense and garbage that's coming down the pike today is absolutely useless. Amen. Oh, it makes you feel good. That gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. 
I don't want a warm, fuzzy feeling. I want to know what thus saith the Lord. Amen. Well, it just makes me feel good when I leave church. I feel good about myself. I hope you all go out of here today examining yourself, not feeling good about yourself. Determining uh, how imperfect you are and what you could do to overcome some of your imperfections when it comes to your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ and with God himself. That's what I hope to challenge you to do. You're okay, I'm okay. But outside the box, what does that mean? That means doing everything that you can outside of the box in order to come up with new ways to get somebody in your seats. That, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's not about the crowd. It's about the Shekinah cloud is what it's about. It's the glory of God is what we're looking for. Not just having a, a big crowd. God has blessed us for a small church. He really has blessed us here. And, and I know the reason you're here is your love of the Word of God, and it's not because I'm seeker sensitive. God knows that. But anyway, God's plan for the local church's edu educational program, well, his plan for the educational program, we need to spend $5,295 a year for Sunday school materials and this, that, and the other. That's okay. You know, some of it's good. If you got good Sunday school materials. But what's his plan for the church, his programs for the church? Ephesians 4, 11, 15 says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For what? The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, getting you guys into ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be not more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I heard about a young pastor. And he was walking by one of his Sunday school classes on a Sunday morning. And he overheard a teacher say, you know, there is no hell. The Bible, the, the, this is just uh, illustrative, but as far as a physical hell, there is no hell. And Christ is really not the Son of God. He was a great prophet, but not the Son of God. Well, the young pastor goes to the leadership of the church and says, hey, this man's teaching Jehovah's Witness stuff. He said, I'll just leave him alone. He's been here a long time and he gets good to the church. Follow me here. That's, that's what you call compromise. He gives good. Now, that same person who made that comment, if you've got a, a vase or a flower pot somewhere in the church, and it's been there for a long time, and it has some kind of meaning that we don't know what is moved that far. Well, you can't be moving that tree. That tree's been there for a long time, just like that. And they'll fight you over something that's stupid, but let false doctrine be taught within the body of Christ. Think about what I'm saying this morning. Well, I think we need to move that tree back. Well, there's some folks in the church that think we don't need to do that. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It says right here on page 575 of our bylaws and blah, 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 this, that, and the other. And that. If we're going to make any changes, what we need to do, we've got to get a committee on committee on committees on committees. And, and then we're going to have to do an investigation of what it would cost in the long run to, to, to get another flower pot in there, to replace that flower pot if you don't like that flower pot. And, how do, how do we get to that place in the body of Christ? Can y'all explain to me how we get so stupid as Christians? How do we get so stupid? I'll tell you how. The devil gets in you. 
The devil, anytime you're battling and fighting over something so trivial and so stupid as a color or a, uh, or, or a, a, a vase or a vase being moved or a tree being moved or doing this or doing that, you are in the flesh. But you don't have a bit of problem with false teaching going on within the body. See, that's how far removed we are from what we ought to be as believers. We need the church to equip us to serve, number one. Number two, we need the church to build us up and encourage unity among the brethren by getting along and putting up with things that we don't necessarily like that other people do. It ain't about you. It's not about you. Let me say that again. I'll say it soft. It's not about you. I don't know where people get this idea. It's about me. It's not about you. Nobody owns the church of Jesus Christ except Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the senior pastor of the church. Jesus Christ does not need bosses in the church. And I, that's inclusive of the pastor right on down the line. There's no place for bosses. The boss is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the plan is found right here in this book called the Bible. If we're using anything else, we're using the wrong thing. Amen. God help us. We need the church that might become more like Christ. Not argue and fight over trivial things. We need a church that we might be grounded in the faith and know what we believe. God help us. Well, what is the church? Why do you need church? Because you're imperfect. And because I'm imperfect. A church is a place for imperfect people. I'm going to stop there this morning. I would like to finish, but I can't. So let's stand up if you will. I went on too many rabbit trails today. But I think they will need rabbit trails. I can hear some of you imperfect people now at lunch. I can't believe he went on them rabbit trails. We'll believe it. But as we begin this new year, I'd like to see unity in our church as never before. I'd like to see all of the nonsense, the triviality, the silliness that goes on with people. God help us. God help us. I haven't had it happen in a long time, but I remember when people used to use the offering plate for their own personal United States mail. They'd drop a little note in there to let me know what they didn't like if there was something I did. Mm. Can you imagine? Hey, let me, let me tell you all this. The offering plate is not the U.S. mail. If you've got a problem, you come to me, okay? And let me say this. The only thing I want in our offering plate is your cold, hard cash. <laughs> now, I know that sounded bad, but <laughs> I was just playing, all right? Somebody got, can you believe that Lenny Grabbing preacher and what he did wants our cold, hard cash? Well, some of you need to let go of some of it before you go home to be with Jesus. Some people think they're going to take a U-Haul on the back of the casket and just head on up to heaven. Last time I said that, I... I didn't see nobody going out. Last time I said that, I had one of my former early members here go walking out the back door over there. He got up. He looked like he was as mad as an old buffalo. I guess he thought he was going to take it with him. Let's get into the spirit of God and the word of God, okay? Let's live by the word of God. Not the triviality that takes place. Not the silliness that goes on. Man, some of the silliest things you hear about in the church just absolutely drives you nuts. And, and the boldness of some people to say it. That really blows you away. David's brother, Art, had a personality somewhat different than mine. And he was used to kind of getting his way. Art was. 
because he was a strong-willed individual. Didn't do it his way, he'd just whip you, and then you had to do it, so. <laughs> but then after he became a pastor, all of a sudden things changed. And I never will forget one thing that Art told me one time. He said, Brother Buckles, he said, one of the hardest things I ever have to do is to hold my tongue. I ain't used to doing that. He said, but when you pastor people, you got to do that. I said, yeah, I guess so, Art. But we need to come together in unity and love for the Word of God and grow in the Word because that's the only way we're ever going to be what God wants us to be as his bride. Ron, would you close in prayer for us?